Brown Records. I am your host, Jessica Bill, and this is episode four of the Found Records. The Found Records is dedicated to um, making sure that history is being retold correctly. Um, and so I've done multiple episodes, such as Marilyn Monroe's life, um, recorrecting her legacy, um, Betty Boop, Michael Jackson's um, allegations, and showing you guys why the court found him not guilty and you know where the allegations derived from. Uh, what was the motive, all that goodness with evidence. And so you guys were really interested in episode three of Michael Jackson. You guys were very surprised by the evidence I showed in that episode. Um, It's a lot of evidence that's been buried by the media for years. And I'm really good at, you know, finding out where to find them. So you guys really wanted me to follow up with an episode four covering Michael Jackson's death. You guys were really interested by that. Um, now I will leave a little disclaimer here right off the bat. We are going to be talking about Michael Jackson's death with us leaning on the side of him being murdered, but because there is not enough concrete evidence to really sentence Conrad Murray as a premeditated murderer, I have to disclaim that this is one of my episodes that are going to be a little bit on the gray area, the conspiratorial ground. Um, there is evidence that makes you want to lean on that, but I can't say for sure it's something that I could present in the courtroom and it be validated. So, um, I think this will be my first episode that is, um, gonna need that disclaimer. And every time I do an episode where, you know, there isn't a clear enough verdict or a clear enough evidence of what I believe, um, I will leave a disclaimer right off the beginning so you know which episodes to take for face value and which episodes to have or, or to use your discernment on. So this is one of them. Um, but from what I've gathered, um, I feel like I am heavily leaning on the side of Michael Jackson being murdered. So let's discuss it. Let's talk about how he passed away. So for those who don't know, Michael Jackson passed away from an overdose of propofol. Now, I'm going to pull out my notes here. I have so many notes just to make sure that I stay on track and I don't miss any information. So I wrote it down before I started talking. Um, So if you see me pull my phone out, it's just my notepad. So um, he passed away from a a high dose, a lethal dose of propofol. Propofol is a sedative used right before surgery to put a patient to sleep. And this was administered by a cardiologist named Conrad Murray. Conrad Murray was assigned to Michael Jackson as his doctor um, 11 days before uh, he passed away, and he was chosen by AEG Live, which is who was running all the concerts. That already, I would like to put a pin on it, a little bit of a red flag. Um... So, like I mentioned, he, he had propofol. This is something that can only be administered and acquired by a doctor. You have to be licensed. It's not something that you can give to yourself. It is often administered with a syringe. And the uh, medicine, the, the sedative is, is something like of a milky quality. So it's like a liquid milky substance. And you would inject it through the vein, just as you would most sedatives for surgery. So to give you an idea of how much drugs was thrown into his system by Conrad Murray, at 1.30 a.m. the morning of June 25th, which is when Michael Jackson passed away, Murray gave him Valium. At 2 a.m., he gave him 2 milligrams of lorazepam. At 3 a.m., he got 2 milligrams of lorazepam, and at 5 a.m. as well. At 7.30 a.m., he gave an additional two milligrams of midazolam at 10.40 a.m. Then he gave him an additional 25 milligrams of propofol diluted with the painkiller lidocaine. And then that is the last of what he administered. He took his alleged bathroom break, which ended up being a 47-minute phone call at 11.18 a.m. He claimed to do CPR on the bed, and any and every doctor knows that CPR is not done on a soft surface. It needs to be on a hard surface. So he did a a lazy attempt at CPR while he was on the phone with the paramedics and the police, and then it was too late by then. Now, what's really weird is that Dr. Murray said that he found Michael Jackson at 11 a.m. not breathing and that he only stepped out for 10 minutes. 
but he originally said that he stepped out for 10 minutes to use the bathroom. Later, it was found out in his call logs that he took a 47-minute phone call where he claimed it was a 10-minute bathroom break. Isn't that strange? Obviously, right off the bat, we can see that there is medical malpractice at play. 25 times the normal amount for a man of his size, that should not even be questionable. That shouldn't even have been done. And any doctor would have declined doing that. Conrad Murray claims that Michael Jackson begged him to administer that much propofol. And while that may be true, because Michael Jackson did have a bit of a drug addiction, not because it was for pleasure, but because he had lots of bodily pains, um, one of them being uh, uh, back pain from when he fell in one of his concerts. Uh, he was on like a truss, like a, like a, like a tall um, elevator type setup, and it actually fell and collapsed. And the second one was the, um, uh, the Pepsi commercial where his scalp had very serious burns from a firework accident uh, meshing with his hairspray. So needless to say, he had multiple lifelong pains to deal with. And of course, um, taking medication early on for those accidents um, obviously deteriorates the body and causes more pain. And it's really just such a slippery slope. So by the time Michael Jackson was doing the concerts, you know, exhausting himself during practice uh, for his final tour, uh, you know, he needed a lot of pain medications. Now, I personally have a dear friend who has chronic pain, and I'm talking in every joint and every part of her body in one way or another, and she does also have a cocktail of prescriptions that help her and aid her through that pain. That is not an abnormal thing to have, a cocktail of painkillers. According to AEG Live, the reps from there, they say that Michael Jackson was in the hunt for a doctor that was willing to administer propofol. And he approached two different doctors and they both said absolutely not. That's not something that we use as a remedy for painkillers and there's a lot of other options to choose from. And allegedly Michael Jackson was very adamant about getting propofol specifically. That detail we cannot prove or deny, um, but regardless of what Michael Jackson, the patient, wanted, it is up to the doctors, just like the other two doctors who said absolutely not, Conrad Murray should have been also in line with absolutely not. Regardless of that fact, um, what really doesn't sit right with me was that Conrad Murray decided to leave the room and take a mysterious phone call for a long time after just freshly administering propofol. And it is law. It is, it is part of training that when you administer a sedative, you always have to watch the patient pretty much until they wake up. Um, it's not something that you can just administer and leave the room. You do need to watch them. You need to monitor their heart rate. Um, it's, it's a very serious thing to put inside of a human body and people can have adverse reactions. So it is bizarre to me that he immediately chose to walk away. This is where I start questioning the motive. Another thing that I just couldn't, you know, put it past is when just before he administered like that lethal amount, Michael Jackson was being recorded by Conrad Murray. Children's record, the biggest in the world. My relationship is popular. You have a movie theater, game room, children, and the press. The other hospitals, the game room, the movie theater, the sick because they depressed, the mind is depressing. I want to go to that. I care about them. So the angels, 
Yeah, yeah, God wants me to do it. God wants me to do it. I'm gonna do it to that. I know you would. I'm gonna have a hope. And I'd like to highlight that even though he's under drugs in this audio, he's still talking about children in an innocent fashion. Like, drugs make you tell the truth. This is a known fact. And the fact that he did not once say anything sexual, but any, if anything, was speaking of them in a very humanitarian-like fashion, uh, with a lot of passion and, and innocence, I feel like that further proves my, my very strong case in episode three. I really wish I included it. I completely forgot that that's what he talked about in that um, audio. Um, but I feel like it just strengthened the case even more. Um, anyways, let's get back to the point. Why would you want to keep that recording? What were you hoping to capture? And also, that is an extreme medical violation. So, do you see why a lot of people off the bat raise a brow at the situation? There's a lot of small details that just don't quite have an answer to them. Why did you leave the room? Why were you recording him before you killed him? These are elements of the case that makes you go, this might not have been an accident. And a lot of people believe, including the Jackson family themselves, and they say this with a lot of confidence, that he was the fall guy. Conrad Murray was paid off to do what had to be done because Michael Jackson was a threat to the industry. Let's go down that rabbit hole. So Michael Jackson just freshly bought the Beatles catalog. This is something that Sony wanted to keep and hold on to. They, they wanted that catalog. They wanted his catalog. Owning catalogs is a very risky business when bigger than thou companies also want it. And Michael Jackson has always been quite spiteful. I'm going to, I'm going to say that Michael Jackson's a little spiteful. Um, and I was very nervous with how publicly spiteful he was choosing to be about people who can make him disappear. And I'm going to name drop one of them, Tommy Mottola. Tommy Mottola was a former CEO of Sony. He was a CEO of Sony at the time. He no longer is anymore. And a lot of people in Hollywood have beef with Tommy Mottola, including Kanye West. Tommy Mottola... Um, has been known for doing very dubious things to their to his artists. And Michael Jackson was no exception. And in fact, here is a clip here, I'm going to pull it up, of Michael Jackson announcing at um, in London that Tommy Mottola was the devil. Sony, be, being a... You know, being the artist that I am... Um, at Sony, I, I, I've generated several billion dollars for Sony, several billion. And um, they, they really thought that my mind is always on music and dancing, and, and, I, and it usually is, but they never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. I own half of Sony's publishing, and, and I'm leaving them and they, they're very angry at me because of it, but um, I just, I just did good business, you know? It's, and Tommy Mottola is a devil. I'm not supposed to say what I'm gonna say right now, but I, I have to let you in on a secret. Say it. No, uh, please don't videotape what I'm gonna say, okay? Turn that off, please. No, what, no, what, I don't mind, tape it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mariah Carey. After divorcing Tommy, came to me crying. Crying. She was crying so bad I had to hold her. And she said to me that this is an evil man. And Michael, this man follows me, she said. He taps her phones. 
and he's very, very evil, and she doesn't trust him, and he is a horrible human being, and we, we have to continue our drive until he's terminated. Oh, there you go! So you can see there that Michael Jackson, the spiteful quality that he has, goes out and says something that would naturally anger a very, very rich man and a very, very rich company. He calls out Sony for their, you know, unfair practices. And he name drops Tommy Mottola for his evil practices as well. That, hearing him say that publicly put a pit in my stomach. Now I want to pull up on screen here um, something that really um, just locks this theory in, and that is a phone call that Michael Jackson had uh, literally just a couple of weeks before he passed away. He told me over and over and over. When he first told me, LaToya, they're going to kill me, I said, who, Michael? First, I thought you're Michael Jackson. Nobody in their right mind would ever think of doing anything like this to you. That's what you think. He says, no, but you don't understand. And then I saw how serious he was. He said, it's bigger than what you think. I said, well, Michael, what is it? He said, it's my publishing. They're after my publishing. They want to take it. As you guys know, my brother had one of the largest catalogs in the world, meaning music-wise. Mm. The and Beatles collection he, was he, one of them. He owned the Beatles, yes. Yeah. There's an elevator music that you hear, just everything. Basically, well, say, a piece of every artist. I'm just kind of, I'm really intrigued because you say that there was somebody at this house and you know yeah. who it was. Can you say who it was? No, I cannot say because there were other Why people at the say? house as well. Because I prefer not to at the moment, but I will say this. I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with several people. Uh, one person I would Is love to safe? have. I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with probably... Um... Mm -mm. I mean, I don't know if you're... <laughs> you say that because there you think that you could... Prince said his father would cry after phone calls, saying, quote, They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. According to Prince, he was referring to AEG Live CEO Randy Phillips and his ex-manager, Dr. Tome Tome. Prince testified that Philip visited Jackson's home and aggressively spoke to Dr. Conrad Murray the night before his father's death. Prince said, quote, he was grabbing by the back of his elbow and they were really close and he was making hand motions. AEG denies involvement in Jackson's death, saying Dr. Murray was not an employee of theirs. Next, I'm going to pull up an alleged leaked phone call from Michael's final days. I want to disclaim that this phone call has not been legally authenticated, so we cannot for certain say that this phone call is authentic. Regardless of that fact, LaToya, Paris Jackson, and a member of AEG, as well as Mr. Ortega, have all said and expressed that Michael Jackson has had this sense of paranoia that he was going to be murdered towards this time. So regardless of whether or not this phone call is legitimate, Michael Jackson did have phone calls in which he was expressing this con exact concern. So if anything, this could just serve as a representation of what that phone call could have sounded like if it's not legitimate. I don't know if I should tell you this, but I don't know who may be listening. The may be a group of people that want to get rid of me. I don't understand it. What do you mean? Talk to me. I can talk about it over the phone. But I don't know how to do it. I don't know where I am. I can't do anything. I don't even care my life anymore. I just want my dream to be okay. My angels. During this time, his bodyguards has, have also found him like locking himself up in the closet, um, having mental breakdowns. It almost seemed as if he had like a, a case of like schizophrenia where he just starts panicking and feels like he's being watched by people. Um, so this is something that not only one person in his family has observed, but a behavior that has been observed by multiple family members and friends. A lot of people during, you know, around 2008, 2009 have said Michael Jackson seemed very paranoid 
um, about being killed. Did you make observations of Michael on that day of June 19, 2009, that caused you concern? Yes. And can you describe what you personally observed on that day, June 19, 2009? That my friend wasn't right, that he wasn't well. There was something going on that was deeply troubling me. And of course, by my friend, you mean Michael? Yes. Michael Jackson? Yes. Had you ever seen him like that uh, previously in that no. condition? I'm sorry. Not like that, no. Now let's go ahead and look at some family commentary. We're going to go straight to Paris Jackson. Paris Jackson has been the most vocal out of all of the, the um, children that Michael Jackson had. Um, Paris Jackson takes this very personally. Um, and, you know, she's got her father's fighting spirit, that's for sure. Um, during Michael Jackson's final days, she made the remark, and I quote, Daddy was always cold. Daddy was always freezing. He would sit and fall asleep by the fireplace. He would always cry, and we would watch to make sure everything was fine and he needed a doctor. And then they turned the lights out. We were in the dark, and they cut the phones off. It's an odd thing for his daughter to say. In the Rolling Stones interview in 2017, Paris says, uh, after being asked, do you believe your father was murdered? She says, and I quote, absolutely, because it's obvious all arrows point to that. It sounds like a total conspiracy theory and it sounds like bullshit, but all real fans on everybody in the, f and everybody in the family knows that it was a setup. They asked her back, who wanted your father dead? Paris says, a lot of people. They asked her back, do you want justice? And Paris says, I definitely do. But it's a chess game, and I am trying to play the chess game the right way. And that's all I can say about that right now. The absolute certainty in her answers. It's bone chilling. All right, so now that I gave you all the pieces of evidence, let's organize them from A to Z and paint the photo. So a few months prior to Michael Jackson being unalived, he is fearful for his life. He's experiencing paranoia. He's saying verbatim that he is going to be murdered for his catalogs and that there are people, very important people after him. This has been said to multiple sources, not just one, so that at least even if the phone call is not uh, authentic, the conversation is authentic. It did happen. 11 days prior to the death, he suddenly gets a brand new doctor from out of state, by the way. This doctor is from Las Vegas. At least that's where he was living during that time, originally from Texas, um, but was living in Las Vegas for this. And this doctor was a cardiologist, a very bizarre, random type of doctor to put at his bedside to administer a surgical anesthesia. So this doctor administers a lethal amount of propofol into Michael Jackson's body in concoction with a bunch of other drugs that were actually said by multiple doctors to be very redundant. There were some redundant medications in a system that didn't need to be together because it was the same, it did the same thing, they were just different brands. So that's also another strange red flag. Then Conrad Murray lies in court about leaving Michael Jackson for just 10 minutes for the bathroom when the investigation turns up that Conrad Murray left for 47 minutes to take a phone call. 47 minutes. And then comes back, calls 911, gives Michael Jackson CPR on the bed. Any doctor and honestly anyone with two brain cells rubbed together knows that you cannot do CPR on a bed. It's too soft. So he wastes time giving him CPR on the bed eventually puts him on the floor and gives him lazy CPR. And then obviously because of that, he passes away. It's just been too much time. And then the police and the, you know, the medical services arrive and perform CPR on Michael Jackson again. Obviously it's far too late. Michael Jackson is now passed away and it is all due to Conrad Murray's incredible medical malpractice. 
there are so many things that have happened that night that were kind of just too obvious, like, duh, of course you don't do this. Of course you don't do that. This is against your medical license. Like, I, to me, it just seems almost intentional by how goofy these decisions were. And because of that, and because of uh, Michael, Jackson, Michael, Michael Jackson being fearful of his life months prior, you can't help but have your brain wander around the idea that Conrad Murray is a fall guy who was paid off to perform medical malpractice and murder Michael Jackson for a lump sum of money because of the catalogs. It is honestly very possible. It really is. Hollywood is no different from any other industry. Um, if, if Mexican cartels and mafias can exist, if gangs can exist, I can't imagine why something of that exact same nature could not exist in that industry, as I'm sure it exists in multiple industries, including science industries as well. Now, Conrad Murray served uh, only four years in prison, which is a slap on the wrist for manslaughter. Um, and... Then he fled. He fled to a different country. So that's really all I have for episode four and all the evidence I could provide. There is nothing concrete enough for me to say that Michael Jackson was intentionally murdered. But using discernment and using the evidence, the small strings of evidence that were left, you know, out on the table, we can lean on that side of it and go, yeah, something's very odd here. I will give him credit, though, if this was a murder, it was very, very intelligent to do it in a fashion that was considered expected of Michael Jackson. An OD of a, of a sleeping aid slash painkiller, I think that was probably the only way you can get away with killing Michael Jackson. Um, but even then, it required someone to take the hit, and that was Conrad Murray. But for four years and a bunch of money that is waiting for him after jail time, maybe it was worth it to him too. I don't know. These are claims that unfortunately we will never be able to say for certain because whatever evidence was left out, whatever evidence could have been collected is long gone now. Um, so what do you guys think? Use your discernment. What is your opinion on this? With the little strings of evidence on the table, do you think that Michael Jackson was intentionally murdered or was it truly medical malpractice? Comment down below and let me know and stay tuned for the next episode. Um, let me know what you guys are going to be interested for upcoming episodes. I have ideas. I think I'm going to keep going down the line of, of parts of history that could give a bit of shock value. Um, things that we never really thought about or looked into before, um, or looked hard enough into. And, uh, I look forward to see what parts of history I can bring back to light and look under the microscope. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I know this is a little bit more of a shorter episode, um, than the last episode, but Again, I just don't have enough to work with to really go into detail the way I did for episode three and Michael Jackson's allegations. Um, but I honestly feel like this is enough evidence to, to form uh, a pretty strong, educated opinion. I'll say that. Um, personally, for me, it does feel very, it, 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 it did feel intentional. It does feel like he was murdered. That's my personal opinion. Um, I think two things can be true at once. Michael Jackson can be addicted to pain medication and Michael Jackson can be murdered by pain medication. I think two things can be true at once. Anyways, I'd like to know your thoughts. So comment down below, make sure you listen to me on Spotify. I just recently uploaded all the available episodes. I finally got my login back. I was logged out for a little bit and uh, now I'm able to log back in. So Check it out on Spotify if you want to listen to it that way. Um, I upload them also as videos on there, but you can listen to them as audios. And you could also find me here on YouTube. So I'll see you guys in the next episode. And thank you for listening to The Found Records.